have several who have been on vacation. Some have returned, some others have taken off today. Quinlan will be gone for a week or so. I guess the school starts again. Uh, the monthly senior fellowship will be the 25th. And I'm not sure how much barbecue we have left, but we have quite a bit of barbecue left in the freezer. And we're going to thaw that out, but we probably need, we need some things brought to be with it, and probably some other dishes also. But we want to remember that. The men's meeting will be the second of December, 4.30. Ladies, we have items to have items to um, discuss, please let one of the men know. Uh, the ladies had a meeting this morning, so that's taken care of. Youth activity of the fruit baskets will be December the 14th uh, to assemble the fruit baskets and deliver them. Those who are older who would normally get a fruit basket, if you know you're not going to be where we can deliver it to you, please let me know, and we'll get that to you on Sunday. And if you want to donate some fruit towards that cause anyone, you can be bringing it to the uh, kitchen closer to the 14th. Uh, Polish and Cool Pit Spark, that's a uh, shut down version of Polish and Cool Pit, Lakeside Church of Christ, March the 10th through the 13th. There's no charge for that, but I think there are 300 seats available, and you have to register early if you plan on going. And there's a flyer, or actually a postcard out in the foyer with the address for you, the email address, and also the phone number. Again, if you have somebody to add to the prayer list that you want on in the bulletin, and announce and please fill out one of the cards in the box in the foyer and in about three weeks if we don't hear from you they'll be taken off the bulletin but in order to hear from you you need to put another card in the box please most of you have been doing that fairly well some of you still are bulking a little bit and trying to just tell me but i don't remember and that's one of the reasons for the box and so that will help us out the men of the congregation uh determined uh, several months back that we would I replaced one of the cabins down at the Bible camp. Uh, the cost for that cabin is $10,000. Uh, at this time, we're needed $4,300 to finish that up. We have to have that money to them by December the 17th. The gentleman who's coming, I think I told you this before, to work on the cabins is coming during the holiday break uh, to work on the cabins. And they can finish, he can finish two cabins in one week. Uh, but if He's not, doesn't have the cash for that for two cabins. He can finish one, and, uh, and we're still paying the same price. So he will, uh, I hope I made that clear, or may not have, but uh, if you don't understand talking to the person, I'll get it through to you. $4,300 is what we lack, having $10,000, and that's from donations, not from the treasury. And uh, the men have said they will take it out of the treasury. If we don't have it, but it would be great if we could get that without touching the treasury. And uh, we ought to be able to raise $4,300. Tomorrow, Roger Butler, this is Sister Carrie's uh, dad, will be having surgery. And uh, he's suffering from cancer, and they're going to try to help him uh, with this surgery. So at this time, we're going to say a prayer on his behalf. Dear God, we're thankful for the blessings we have. We're thankful, Father, we live in a world where there are doctors and nurses who can help us in our, in our maladies. And we or illnesses. This time we're mindful of Roger Butler, Father, and we pray our blessings upon him, help him to rest this evening. We pray for his doctors and nurses and he'll rest good. And pray tomorrow as they are together and they begin the surgery on him, the doctors will be able to do the things to help him and maybe be able to find a solution to this problem he's having. We pray our blessings upon his family and bless them, Father, and encourage them. Pray especially for Sister Carrie, strengthen her father during this time, and help us to be a help to her. We're mindful of others, Father, who are having afflictions at this time. We pray thy blessings upon them. We're thankful Sister Carolyn Thompson is doing better. We pray that you can bless her also. Go with us through this service and through the rest of our lives. In our son's name, we pray these things. Amen. 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 Appreciate Brother Kevin leading the songs that he did this afternoon. We are going to study tonight, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? That was the last song that we sang. We're not going to take the little verses of the song to discuss this. We're going to discuss the topic. We've looked at this before in the past. We're going to do some other things we need to, to look at. And so let's begin our lesson together. We look at the, 
the story of Christ and many of the artists' rendition of Christ and different things he did. But I like the words of Paul here in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. He's talking to the brethren there at Philippi. He said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every name should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In looking at this passage, and he's talking to the brethren there about the mind that Christians ought to have, we think about Christ coming to earth, think about what he was willing to give up to come and, and to do the things he did. First of all, just to become a human being, to leave heaven and become a human being, but to know in his lifetime what was going to happen to him and how it was going to happen. And so we see him being doing these things, and there's a reason behind that. He did it so we could have salvation. We talked about that this morning. But notice, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. In the garden, when he was praying, not thy, my will but thine be done, he could have called for the angels to come at any time and to, to take him from that situation, but he did not choose to do that. The angels ministered to him, but when he was on the cross, he didn't call for this a halt to all this. He went on and endured that suffering for us. Now, that's determination. You know, I've seen some of y'all sometimes determined to do something and you're going to do it or bust. Now, that may be not the way we need to look at Christ and what, he's, what he did for us, but really that's the attitude he had. He came to do a job and, and he made sure that job was carried out. He knew without him doing that, we couldn't have salvation. No one could have salvation, but he was willing to do it. And so when we think about the idea of let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, we need to have the attitude that he had that we're going to serve him no matter what. We're going to follow him. It doesn't matter what the world says is okay. It's what God says, and that's what we're going to do. Well, we think about this. <laughs> we need to understand that Christ came so he could understand our plight. He could understand our feelings. You know, becoming a man is, is the heart of, of Christ's priesthood. Because, you see, if he had not come to earth, he wouldn't know about the things that we suffer. He wouldn't know about the temptations that we suffer. And I've heard people say, well, yes, but he was the Son of God. He wouldn't have sinned anyway. That, that opportunity was there. But, yes, I know what his nature was, but that opportunity was there. If that opportunity wasn't there, then he doesn't truly know how we deal with sin. We think about this, the political priesthood, they understood the people they were dealing with because they lived among them and they were human beings. They walked the face of the earth just like those that they ministered to. But in thinking about this, Christ became flesh to understand what it was to be a man. Now, I don't know what temptations you have to face each day. I don't know what temptations you faced in your life. But as we think about all these things, if Christ hadn't come, he would have no idea, but he does. And he understands that. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 15, he says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I like that passage. I like that passage. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be hurt. He knows what it is to cry at the, at the tomb of a, of a friend. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to have people mock him and to spit on him. He knows what it's like to be crucified. I hope I never have to endure that. But he knows what it's like. But he was willing to do it. He was touched with the feelings of our firmity, but, the, but was at all points like as we are, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, again, that opportunity, that, that um, coming of temptation to him showed that he had the opportunity to do it, but he chose not to. Now, I like the rest of this passage that he brought to us. <clears throat> and he said, let us therefore come boldly 
under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. Notice this, in time of need. We think about being able to come boldly under the throne of grace. I've told you before, I, I've sat by the bed of a loved one, I've sat by the bed of some of your loved ones, and I've, I've offered prayers to myself, I've offered prayers in the room while they were there, I've offered prayers after they passed from this life, and sometimes I just don't know what to say. You know, again, preachers aren't magical. You know, we don't, we don't have a, a little book that tells us, well, here's what you do here, here's the prayer you say here. Those prayers have to come from the heart. But I understand from what God's Word teaches that when my mind and my heart and my words fail, the Holy Spirit takes over. He takes over. And that comfort that He offers, not miraculously, no, that's not it at all, but He takes those prayers to God because He knows the feelings of our hearts. And so when Christ came and He was... <coughs> touched with the infirmities that we have. That helps the Godhead understand when we're, when we're in that moment, when we're in that, in that place where we, we just don't know what to do or what to say. He knows our hearts. And God then knows what it is that we're feeling. And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't have to shrink back and be afraid. We don't have to say, well, I, I just don't know if I can take this to God. Yes, you can take it to God. Now, it's not like the little child praying for that present on December 25th. Dear Lord, please let me get this, this, and this. It's not like that at all. The idea is that our, our troubles, our trials, and tribulations, we take those to God. Our, sometimes our blessings and how happy we are. And I hope we always take the time to do that. Jesus came to earth and suffered for us, but when we're in, in a time of joy and happiness, we need to make sure that we, we take those things to God. Now, Christ's coming help was help because the empathy enables him to be the perfect mediator for us between, between God and ourselves. Now, I understand what the Catholic Church says. The Catholic Church says the Pope is the mediator, but friends, that's just simply false doctrine. That's not true. Christ is the only mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the one and the only one that mediates for me before the throne of God. I'm glad he's there. I'm glad he's there because he's, he can plead my case. And when I've sinned, like I talked about this morning, when I've sinned and I come to God and I'm asking for his forgiveness, here's my, here's my lawyer. Here's the one that tells God, Riley has sinned, but he's forgiven of that, and my blood paid the price. He's the mediator for us between us and God. Well, being a perfect mediator, he's the only person to ever be both God and man. We have trouble wrapping our minds around that sometimes. How can you be 100% God and 100% man? But we need to understand this was God's plan from the beginning, that this was the way he was going to save mankind. <clears throat> God through Christ experienced all that we faced. Again, he faced hunger and thirst and hurt, being tried and tempted, all the things humans have to go through. Now, we sang that song a while ago, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? I, I really like that song. I like the tenor part especially and, and the, well, the bass part too. But <laughs> when we sing that song, <clears throat> pardon me, I hope we understand what, what he's talking about. And know that he came to earth for me. But when I sing that song, yes, I know he came for y'all too, but he came for right. And that makes me happy. Makes me sad too that he had to endure those things. I wish I could have been perfect, but I can't be. I was talking in a class this morning. One of our one of our young young people didn't shake their head yes or no about uh, perfection and we Pretty soon figured out they weren't perfect. But nobody is. But you see, the perfect one, our perfect mediator, came to earth for us. And he is there for us. Notice these passages in John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was noticed with God, and the Word was God. 
He's talking about Christ. The same was the beginning of God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was nothing made that was made. In Him is life, and in the life there was the life of men. Without <coughs> Without him coming to earth, mankind itself had no hope of eternal salvation. And then, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You know, I can't imagine being one of the apostles and knowing here is the Son of God, and I'm with him. I'm with this Messiah, the one that we've thought of for all these years, and, and been told about by the prophets, and being able to walk with him and see him perform those miracles, can't imagine what that would be like. But he came to this earth. They witnessed those things. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ came to this earth. He walked among men. He, he walked among men. He did the things that, that God had intended for him to do. He carried out his mission. He came to set the perfect example for us too. This artist's rendition of Christ falling on the cross probably isn't even close to what it's like. But we think about this being our perfect example. It says, "For even to hear what He called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps." Christians are asked sometimes things from God that they say, "Well, I just don't know about that." I don't want to do certain things, or I don't want to do certain things. But God has already said, this is how you do it. Here are things, here are things that are sins. Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> here are things that are sinful. You can't go to heaven that way. Somebody says, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just a human being. I've talked to people many times about <coughs> marriage situations, and, and, and they start, like, but you know, we were so young. It doesn't matter, young or old, God's law says what it says. And that's what we got to follow. Christ went to the cross. Remember the prayer again. Father, let thy will be done and not my will. What was Christ thinking about at that time? If there's another way, let's, let's find another way. You may not agree with that, but I, I can't see any other way around it. But he knew whatever the Father's will was, that's what he was going to do. And he did that. 1 John 2, verse 6, He that sent the invited of him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Every step he has taken. Thank you, Larry. Every step that he's taken. Good go. <laughs> Every step that he took. You know, we studied the book of John some years back uh, in our lectureship. Every step. When you read the book of John, no, he's headed to the cross. He's headed to the cross. Every step he took, took him just one step closer to what he's going to have to do. When you think about knowing that, I can recall back when I was in school, high school, not college. I was pretty good in college. But I can remember one morning, we got there early to meet another guy who was standing inside a double glass door. And we thought how funny it would be the secretary, the, the one of the seniors was the secretary of one of the teachers, and we thought how funny it would be to lock her out. And it was probably a good 20 degrees outside, so we just locked the door and laughed at it. Well, some of you youngers don't remember, but we had, <clears throat> we had shoes, even guys did, that were about yay high at the heel and the soul was about like that and she had a set of those on and she just went to kick the metal door and guess what she kicked? She kicked the glass broke it all to pieces they weren't so funny then. well I remember the dread of you know, finding out what the principal had to say about that and I really remember the dread when I went home and told my parents that door was going to cost us all together all three of us, because she was involved too, four hundred dollars, and we didn't have that kind of money. Well, I can remember those steps, steps to the office. I remember the steps to my mom. My dad was gone working. I didn't go. I just 
didn't run up there and say, what are we going to do about this? But you see Christ walking those steps to the cross, the, the, the dread, that would be worse than that. But he went anyway. He kept walking step after step headed to the cross. That's the way I've got it. This was my perfect example. I've got to follow the Lord. Sometimes it may be my family disagrees with me. I'm sorry, I've got to follow the Lord. Sometimes my friends say, why don't you do, why don't you do what we do? I'm going to follow the Lord. I don't care what you do, what you call me, how you laugh at me, how you hurt me. I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to follow the Lord. He never <laughs> gave a command that he didn't submit to the same. Look at this passage here. You're not going to look them up. Our time's almost gone. But he said, love your enemies. And then he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you think about that. He taught, love your enemies. Do good to them that persecute you. And even for the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, <clears throat> he said, do the will of the Father, Matthew 7, 21. Again, there in the prayer, not my will, but thy be done. You see, he just didn't say things and, and not set the example. He said the things and then he set the example for us to follow. So that we can see this is how we need to be. He said men ought to pray, Luke 18, 1. Then look at all the times he prayed. I like reading the, the times when, when he prayed, when he, went, when he went away to pray. You know, sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes we need to pull ourselves away from, <clears throat> from our family, from even from our loved ones for a few moments and just talk with God. And just talk with God and tell God the things that are on our heart, on our mind. Christ is our perfect example. He had to be flesh. <clears throat> he had to become flesh and become an offering. Uh, there really was no other way around it. He had to provide the perfect sacrifice. We've talked about that. Perfect man sin, so there had to be a perfect sacrifice. Again, 1 Peter 1, go there, 18 and 19. He says, For so much as you're not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from your main conversation or life received in the condition of your fathers, those things aren't going to save you. But you're saved with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and the Lamb without blemish and without spot. That's the sacrifice he gave. He had to put on this, this earthly mold that we have so that he would experience those things. And removable sin comes about. It's always a fire of blood. He would write again in chapter 9, verse 22. And almost all things by the law purged with blood are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. And so Christ had to come to be this perfect sacrifice. Animal sacrifices weren't, weren't good enough. <clears throat> You've heard it said before, I've said it. There's no telling the, the rivers of blood that would, would be to gather together if, if all the animal sacrifices that were made from the very beginning till the time of Christ were put together. Again, Hebrews 10, 4 through 6. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes to the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest. But a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Those offerings didn't forgive sin. They postponed the punishment for those sins until Christ could come. And, and when Christ came and died on the cross, then forgiveness was had. And that blood not only comes to us, but that blood goes all the way back to Mother Eve and, and, and Adam. Because that blood forgives sins. All those animal sacrifices didn't do it. And so Christ came, and, and, and the Hebrew writer helps us to understand. The Lord understood what his sacrifice was all about. He knew it was going to happen. He knew we needed it. And so he provided a perfect sacrifice for us. Becoming that perfect sacrifice, a man of flesh, flesh and blood that lives sinless. That lives sinless. That's almost... Hard to believe, isn't it? But Jesus did it. 2 Corinthians verses 8 and verse 9, For we know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty 
by, that Jesus through his poverty might be rich. Now I want you to think about that. Young and old alike. Christ, though he were, were rich, was willing to give up all that. That rich is the word used there. We're not talking about he had a lot of money and gold and things like that. Where was he? He was in heaven. He was with the Godhead, but he was willing to give all that up. Give all that up and come to us. So that come to earth so that we could have the salvation of our souls. And because he suffered that, every one of us, every one of us was a meal to the word of God. Sacrifice was on our behalf. The prophets told us that. Isaiah chapter 53, the eunuch was reading this on the road to Damascus, on the road to back home to uh, Ethiopia. I had Paul there for a minute, all right? Isaiah wrote these words. He said, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet did we esteem him smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want you to take that seriously. I want you to realize, as I realize, that every sin I make, every sin, every temptation I fall prey to, one strike, one of those strikes was for right. Can't you hear that whip? Can't you hear that whip on the wall? First time will be hard enough, but to keep going and going and going, that was for us. Why won't we follow him? Why won't we treat him? His sacrifice was for us. I found this, and I really like this. God loves you this much. How many of us have said to our children, how much you love me? I love you this much. When Susie's dad was, was alive, he would uh, be doing that with the children. And Susie would ask him, how much you love me? He said, I'm in trouble now, so y'all have me all said. But God loves you this much. Just think about that. Love man has never known was given at the cross. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. But when we were yet without strength, <clears throat> in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man we would not die, but for a venture for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us this much. He could have turned his back. He could have walked away. No, I'm not going. But he did. He said, Moreover, then being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You don't want to fall into the wrath of God. You just don't want that to happen. You read in the Old Testament the number of times that people failed to obey God and the wrath of God was released. And what happened? He said, from, him, from the wrath through him we're saved. If then when we were enemies we were reconciled to God and to be saved by his life, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. For not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, but whom now receive the atonement. To provide the love that we need, the, the understanding of love we need. And that's one of the reasons Christ came to earth. A love bestowed by God upon man. A blessing. I don't get it. I really don't. We're so wicked. We do so many things. The world is so getting loveless. And there was another time when the world got so wicked that God repented of human man. And he destroyed all that no one was found. So that Christ one day could come. That we could be here. That love bestowed by God, 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So that we can become the sons of God. You name any family around, any, any popular family. They adopt children, and everybody praises them for adopting children. But God says, I'm about to kill a baby. You can be my adopted child. That's the love that God's bestowed upon man. The verse we're familiar with, John 3, 16. God's the love of the world. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That, that love, provided by God, shows us the love that we need to have. You need to love God enough to give up whatever's keeping you from being a faithful child of God. You need to give up whatever's keeping you from obeying God in the first place. That love that's sacrificing. That love that's giving. God is our sacrifice. Why did the Savior come to earth? Well, there are a lot more reasons. But we need to understand He came to earth. He came to earth for us so that we could have salvation. And He loves us. He wants us to go to heaven. But do we want to go to heaven? You know, tonight as you